the network. Bow. What's up, everybody? Once again, it's Brand Man Sean, and I haven't done this in a while, but I got an interview for an individual who is is pretty accomplished. You know what I'm saying? Uh, he's done quite a few things. Uh, just to read a little bit off his resume, he's the former VP of Bad, Bad Boy Records and Diddy Road Management. It's probably stories on stories from that alone, right? It's one of the biggest impacts in hip hop, that whole camp. All right, then you have the CEO of Power Moves Inc. Currently, he's doing a lot of things with, with that and the Global Spin Awards, which if you don't know, right, Global Spin Awards is one of the, the, the few platforms that truly honors DJs um, today, which they're, they're, they're the core and the heartbeat of the culture, right? You know, it was, it was, it was more DJ and MC before it was so heavily rap. You get what I'm saying? So um, there, there, there's so much I could talk about um, just from the research, not the things I've gotten seen um, from you, Sean Prez, to introduce him officially as Sean Prez. But first and foremost, we'll, we'll get into the details, but, but how you doing, sir? Yo, Sean, I'm doing good, man. It's, all, it's always my pleasure to be in the presence of another Sean. So I, f- I feel like family. I feel like I'm right at home. So yeah, It's a rare occasion. I always take note when it is. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, hey, as I started to tell you before we even hop, um, like got into the official part of the interview, because you've done so much, right? So many different things, right? I read a little bit off the resume. I'm sure there's so many things that you you don't even put out there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because I, I would like to really just dig into how you think, right? Yeah. Because we hear so much on, yo, this is specific advice on this and specific advice or a little bit of story here. But the people who achieve constantly, what I've found is most important that you want to get from them is how they think about problems, how they view opportunities, right? And how they process in general. So um, that's where I want to go with things. But before we get a little bit more in depth, can you give us an idea how you got into this thing, right? Like the first thing off, off the resume is the VP of Bad Boy Records. How do you even get, become a part of of such a storied history like that? You know, whenever I get a question like this, it's always so difficult for me to answer it because I literally have lived this, I'm on my fourth career and each one of them I have achieved at a very high level. And I'm a humble guy and I don't say that in a braggadocious way, but you know, I have had extreme success in the music industry. Uh, I created a marketing and promotions agency that has, you know, still to this day does extremely well, the, the founder of the Global Spin Awards, and now I'm a motivational speaker. So when I think about the music industry days, getting into the music game, for me, it wasn't like what it, you know, I didn't have an easy road. It was very, very challenging, very difficult. I had a million doors slammed in my face. People know me for Bad Boy Records because that's where I finally got my foot in the game. But truth be told, over the course of six years, I took five different unpaid internships. Every time I took it in, and when I say unpaid, it, it was unpaid. That means no car fare. That means no lunch money. That means if you want to work here, you better figure out a way to get here. And once you get here, you better figure out a way to eat because we're going to give you the experience. We're going to let you in the building. But other than that, you on your own. So- Every single time I took an internship, you know, I worked for independent record labels. I worked at Atlantic Records. I worked at Arista Records. So so many um, different record labels. And I just couldn't get a job. I was made to feel like I was unhirable. So when I got to Bad Boy, and this is the part that people need to understand, like so often we want to tap out. So often we say, you know, I got this dream and, and, and I want to do X, Y, and Z. Okay. If that's the case, you're going to be tested. God don't just give you stuff on a, on a silver platter. I was tested. It took me damn near six years to get the bad boy. And when I got there, it was like the holy grail. I was right at the front line of a record label that would change history. It would change entertainment. It would change music. And all of those years that I thought were a waste of my time, I kept getting told no. I couldn't get a job to save my life. I came in so battle tested the bad boy. People ask, how did you rise to VP? Because by the time I got there, 
I was like a soldier who had been to Vietnam, World War II, Korea, and every other. I was Rambo. By the time I walked in the building, I just was so damn battle tested, and I shot up the ranks. So, it, you know, it, 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 I guess I would sum it up to say I started as an intern. The, to me, the best way to ever get in the music industry if you're trying to work behind the scenes. But it was a lot of hard work to get to that point. And I just don't believe there's any wasted um, experiences in our life because what I thought was a wasted experience, not getting those other jobs turned out to be the best thing for me. Mm. So you, you talk about not getting jobs and made to feel like you were unhirable. What was that like at that time, right? Like what, were, what was the feedback that you were getting to be um, unhirable? No, that's a great question. And, and, you know, I know, Sean, you work with a lot of independent artists. Uh, you know, you you really provide uh, great insight on how independent artists can market themselves and brand themselves and really get their music out there to the masses. If you ask me how I felt, it felt like I was one of them independent artists that I'm putting out record after record, song after song, single after single, mixtape after mixtape, yeah. and I can't get nobody to listen to me. I can't like for the life of me, I couldn't get a fan base. So you what what you are to so many independent artists is what Bad Boy eventually was for me. Whereas you finally, when people knock on your door and you say, you know what, I'm gonna take you on as a client. I'm gonna really show you how to take your career to the next level. That's what it was like for me. But before that, I just felt like I know I'm dope. Just like so many artists, they know they're dope. They know if the world the world ever just heard them, it, they could change the game. They could be the next big one. But you have to stay believing in yourself. You And I tell this to people all the time. When you got a dream, everybody ain't going to see your dream. God gave it to you. He didn't give it to Brand Man Sean. He didn't give it to Sean Prez. He gave it to you. And back in them days, God gave me a dream to be in the music industry. I was going to one day be a real player in the game. Nobody else saw that because they wasn't giving me a job. <laughs> but, like, like real talk. But I couldn't turn back on what I had in here. And I couldn't turn back on what I had in here. And if anybody's looking to, listening to this on podcast form, I'm pointing to my heart and to my head. God gave me this dream and I just could not go back because I had to trust and I had to believe that, yes, I am one of the dopest dudes ever to walk this planet. I believe that. I don't care if y'all don't see it. And I'm going to keep walking forward until the day that I see light at the end of that tunnel. And that's mm -hmm. truly what it felt like for me. I felt like a starving artist. Got you. No, that's, that's dope. And I, that's a great analogy. Um, I mean, with that being said, well, you got to the label bad boy and you actually started to get into work. What were the experiences? What were the things that you were doing that helped them see you finally and acknowledge that, yo, this guy is like, he's delivering. What, what were those first like jobs that you had? Well, I'm going to answer your question short and then I'll go into a longer, uh, uh, more expanded answer. Okay. You asked me, what was I doing? work period <laughs> like it's as simple as that like everybody wants the glitz everybody wants the glamour everybody wants the fame and the fortune but before you get there before you get noticed before anybody on planet earth knows your name or even cares to know your name you gotta put in the work and to quote my man, Ed Hennens, he said, nothing works like the work. And it's just that simple. So when I got in the door, I'm going to keep it 100 with you. I wanted to be an A&R. That was always my dream. But Bad Boy was like, look, we're only looking for people to be on a street team. A&R, like, we don't need no more people working in the, &R, like, in, in the studio. So it was take it or leave it. And for me, I had to get in where I fit in. And I had, you know, Inky Johnson, who, you know, you're from Atlanta. He, he's, he's another Atlanta icon. He got a quote. 
play the hand you dealt like it's the like it's the hand you always wanted. I was handed the street team hand. So I had to play that hand like it's the hand that I always wanted. And I went so hard and so aggressive on those streets. And then finally, and, and mind you, I didn't even want this job. When I they saw how crazy I was going on the streets, handing out flyers, telling people and really marketing and letting people know all of our next upcoming acts and upcoming singles and you know when albums was gonna drop. They was like, yo, if you're doing this so hard here in New York, maybe you should come in the office and start to run our national street team. Like replicate what we're doing here in New York and go city to city, state to state and find all of these different influencers who can do what you're doing right here. Mm. And then I did that. And then I got promoted and I started to work on mix show radio. And from there, I started to work on um, regular rotation radio and, yeah. and then became Puff's tour manager and, and road manager. And I just kept excelling, kept excelling, but it really comes down to, I kept my head low. I never started feeling myself. I always understood because I got passed over for so many internships over the years. This was a privilege. I didn't have to be here. There's a million people who want to be in this spot. I take this serious. Yes, we, we, we the hottest label. Yes, you know, you got Biggie, Faith, Mace, Locks, all of these different iconic acts at the time. I'm the hottest fish grease out there but I always kept my head low because I understood nothing works like the work. So to answer your question, I work like a savage, man. Hustle, hustle. That's it. Okay. Now, you. Now I, it's great to hear that you were on that street team early on because there's so much, you know, marketing. That's 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 where I come from. And, now, and it actually, right, it's interesting that you wanted to do that. I mean, you didn't want to do that, but you got didn't want to do it. And I personally, just hearing your story and, and knowing, you know, a little bit about what you do now, it seems like that street team probably gave you a lot of that marketing know-how or understanding from a trenches level. And, and now it reflects in what you're doing today. You started, you now have a marketing agency that, that, that's killing it and all that stuff, you know? So it's, it's dope to see that you're just taking whatever you're served with and making it work one way or another. Are there some... Are there, well, actually, I'll say this first. Do you think a street team could be valuable today in the digital era? I know a street team could be valuable today in the digital era. Why you I, I feel like that is, you know, I'm going to tell you something, Sean, this is as real as I can put it. There is no substitution for Sean telling Sean, you got to check out this artist. Yeah. This dude or this chick is crazy. She's the next one. He's the next one. That peer to peer, mouth to mouth, coming from a reliable source, somebody who you know, love and trust, putting you on to what's next. There's no substitution for that. Yes, you can hit more people more quickly on digital. There's no doubt about that. But the part that so many of these young artists, they want to skip the line. They want to take the easy way out. And they're not putting in the hustle on the ground. And I've always been a firm believer that you got to start on your block. Like, you got to start in your hood. You got to start in your region, in your city. People got to be screaming your name. That's where your army, your tribe, where, where, where your fan base where people are like, yo, like where, where it might just start with you. And then it's a few people on your block. Then it's people in your school and people in your neighborhood. And it just grows and grows and grows. Those are your soldiers. So I believe, you know, a street team is as valuable today as it always has been. It, you know, but a lot of people want to take the easy way out. And a lot of people, it's, it's, it's much easier to push a button on your computer. It's much easier to upload something on your phone and say, okay, go check out my new joints on iTunes. That's easy. Hitting the bricks, hitting those clubs, doing all of the stuff locally that you should be doing, traveling city to city, state to state in, 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 in a 
in a van with about six of your boys, people stinking, breath stinking, sleeping on the highway, all of that stuff, that's hard. Nobody wants to put in that work. But what about artists who aren't club artists? Do you think they could get value, right? More of a pop style or, I don't know, a hipster style or something like that? Do you think they can get value from a street team? I do. I, I honestly do. You don't, you don't have to be in the club. Like, we have broke... Truth be told, over the course of my career, I know I started at Bad Boy, but I, like you said, I have a marketing agency. We've marketed every artist under the sun. And I don't care if you're r &B, I don't care if you're a pop artist. Having people endorse you, scream your name, um, hit people where they live, work, and play, get you familiar with a new single, and just talk to you about it. It does make a difference. But everything doesn't start in the club. Sometimes things just start right in front of your building, right in your hood. So I, you know, I believe that, that it doesn't matter. Okay. Well, while we're on it then, what's the code to proper street team marketing? How do you break that down into a science to execute? You know, that's a great question. I don't know that there's one specific answer with it. That's almost like me asking you, what, what's the code? Um, you know, and I did have, when, when, when I sat down and spoke with you, I was like, yeah, what's the cheat code? Um, and you <laughs> told me like, nah, it ain't no cheat code in, in terms of digital. You put in the work and you get out of it what you put in. And then ultimately you gotta, you, you gotta have a hot product, right? So yeah. it's, it's the same thing, whether it's digital in terms of marketing or whether it's on the ground, offline marketing. For one, it starts with a hot product. And let me, let, me, let, me, let me tell you something that I'm sure you know, and I think your audience needs to listen up to this. When I was working records actively, mm -hmm. every artist, every A&R, when, when they come out of that studio, I'm a marketing guy, I'm a promotion guy. But the a and and the artists, they're studio rats. That's where they live. That's where they hibernate. And everything that they, that they do in that studio, they didn't listen to that record 500 times at 100 decibels to, to blowing your mind damn near. And they love every snare. They love every kick drum. They love everything about it. And they all come out and think it's hot. But what, I know, what I've come to learn, a dope record it talks back to you. A dope product, it talks back to you. It don't matter what it is. It could be a record, it could be a regular product out there. You can market the hell out of whatever, but if people are not feeling it, they're not feeling it. But you're always gonna know when you got some heat on your hand because your phone start ringing. People start to call you like, yo, it's right here, it's kind of crazy you start to see them numbers running up. So when you ask me what's the code, the code is number one, put in the work. You know, first and foremost, you gotta know, and, and, and I love that you broke down or you asked me earlier about every artist is not a club artist. Well, that might be true. Figure out where is your audience? Where do they live? Where do they work? Where do they play? And then you have to attack them in their environment, not where you want them to be, not where you feel most comfortable, but the code is to go to them, market to them in a place where, where, where they are just chilling at. Introduce your music there, introduce your product there. And that's when they're most receptive to it. That's when their guards are down and they can give you real feedback, but it always starts with a great product. Got it, got it. Hey, yeah, I, look, I, I can't speak enough on on great product that makes everybody's job so much easier. Oh, really? Do have you have you had an experience pitching a product that wasn't so great? Had experience pitching a hundred products that wasn't so great. <laughs> like, like, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, I, I I have pushed. Uh, you know, we work with with upstart beer companies that they swore was going to be the next great beer. People taste it and it's like, what's this piss? Like, get this out of here. My job is to get it to the people. I can't make them like it. Yeah, I can just get it to them. I've worked with a million artists that swore that. That right there, that right there huh? is something that people who don't 
who've never hired a marketer before or they need more experience have to understand. The job is to distribute and put in front of the people. You cannot make them like it more if it's, if it's bad. You can, make, you can even make it more digestible, but you can't make them like it. What you can do is you can expose it to them. Mm -hmm. You can ram it down their throat. And I don't mean down their throat, but you can saturate their world to wherever they go, whatever they're doing, they see that logo. They see the artist's name or the brand's name or the, or the product's name. You can do all that. That's your job as a marketer. So people, need, you know, if, if somebody came up to a random and was like, yo, do you know who Brand Man Sean is? Be like, I, I don't know him personally, but I see that name everywhere I go. Okay. But what we can't do is make them like the product. And that's what a lot of these artists, they get it twisted and they think you're not doing your job because they don't get the feedback that they're looking for. When you hire a marketing agency or a marketer, you, you judge them based on awareness. You judge them based on them presenting your product to the right audience. Now, right. if you're a rapper, and you hire a marketer and, and, and he got your joint at, at a country music concert, then that's the wrong marketer. Uh, yeah, the, yeah. the right marketer should be able to distinguish, like me and you talked about throughout this conversation. You know, even within rap music, there, there are different genres of rap. And we need to be able to decipher well, who's the best audience for this type artist. But we can't make them like the product. Right. Right. Well, like you've actually, you know, touched on the next thing, right? That transition out of music into or from bad boy records and more general music exec um, a part of your career into, hey, I have a marketing agency and I'm working with companies like a beer company, right? Which is so far removed. How do you even get into that? Why did you get into that? And, um, and then let's talk about how, how it worked out for you. Okay, I'll start with the, with the how first. Yeah. The how was, and this is something I tell people all the time, and I hope your audience is, is really locked in and they're paying attention. Do good work. That first and foremost, do good work. I got on people's radars. I never, I never dreamed big enough to market products outside of music. But within music, I did a hell of a job. I took every record that I worked extremely serious. My name was on the line. Forget the artist's name. Forget Bad Boy. Sean Prez's name was on the line. That's how I took it. When you hand that, when, when Puff or my man Harpier handed a record off to me, it was like putting it in the hands of a uh, uh, Freaking, who, who's one of the greatest running backs out there? Emmett, Emmett, Emmett Smith or somebody. I, I don't know. Because I'm yeah. not really a football dude. But it's like putting it in the hands of Kobe Bryant or putting it in the hands of, of LeBron James or Michael Jordan. That's how I took it. I'm going to deliver this. Right. So I started to get calls because people wanted to know who is behind all of these incredible acts that keep hitting and keep hitting and keep hitting. Yes, you got to give Puff and Harv their flowers. Puff was Puff. Harv was, was, was the head a and at the company who went on to be the president of the company. So they was making hits. They made my job easy. But there's a lot of people who have hits and don't break those records. And the way we had those streets and the way we had those clubs popping, I was like a, 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 a animal. I was, I was a savage out there. So people who were not in our industry, they still party, they still walk the streets. And I started to get calls from these, these corporate execs who work in marketing, who was like, yo, you know what? I know you do records, but we need to hit that audience that you specialize in. Mm. And, you right. know, like that's what mattered. And when I really started to think about it, music, it, it, it's a widget. My talent was not music, although I thought it was. 
My talent was marketing. My talent, my my talent was getting into these black and brown communities in a way that you know, Colgate, Palm Olive, HBO, ESPN, all of these companies, they couldn't get into our community in a seamless way like I could. I could take their corporate message and I could change a few words and I can add a little something to it and I can make it stick within our community and everybody now is talking about it. So that's the how, they, they approach me. The, the, the why I started doing it, just truth be told, those checks were, it's crazy. Like, like, it's, <laughs> like <laughs> music checks are nice, but those corporate brand checks is a different, like that's a different beast. Like th that, that's something different. So for me, and, 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 and I don't want to, I don't want to say it because I never work for money. I truly don't. Yeah. That's a benefit to what I do. So when I say the why, yes, the, 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 the benefit was the checks, but it allowed me, I never, I never, I never wanted to, to, to be the biggest uh, fish in a small pond. I, 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 I'm trying to play this game to win and win on a very, very high level. So if that means expand my circumference, get out of my comfort zone, why not? Yes, I do records, but I can also market Big Macs. I can also market sneakers. Yeah. I can also market when, 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 when Dr. Dre, Beats by Dre first came out, it was us putting them on those DJs across the country. I can also market headphones. Why can't I? Same thing. So that, that's the why and that's the how. And I don't know what your third question in there was. No, I mean, we, we basically already alluded to it because it's just wanted to get into the details and the process of, of, of going through it. Um, like how you did, what was the success looking like? And obviously, you know, you did find success in it, but that first brand that you work with, uh, well, actually, before I even say that, it's huge just to hear uh, yet again, doing something at a high level will bring that uh, that attention to you over time. Or just like you just did the work where you were before. It seems like that's your model, right? Just do the work, do the work, do the work. Um, and when you did do it well, people will find a way for you because every everybody has needs. Somebody, everybody needs somebody to do the work, right? <laughs> like, right. Especially people who, with money and enough time taken from the work that they're doing where they can't do the, the, the other work that they need. All right, so those people are always looking for people like that. Um, your first time working with a brand, what brand was that, if you can say, a week, like outside of music, and what type of campaign was that? I really don't remember. I mean, we're going back so many years. I don't remember what my first brand was outside of music. Uh, okay. Because we were. I mean, I, I've worked in so many categories. I, I, I've worked again. I mentioned Colgate Palmolive. I know they weren't my first brand, but they were in the early stage of me branching out b b beyond music. What was that like? Because that's, I mean, you're talking about dishwashing liquid? No, like toothpaste. At that time, at that time. Oh, okay, okay. Palm Olive is, oh, is there a. The, 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 the parent company is called Colgate okay. Palm Olive. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so the same people who Palm Olive had um, soap, dishwashing soap, that, that's a Colgate company. Got it, got it. Yeah. Okay, so toothpaste, what was that like then? You know, it was it was it was dope because it challenged us to to think outside of the box, right? Like we came up with so many great campaigns for Colgate Palmolive. Like one of the things at that time they were they were marketing, I, I, and I forget what it's called. It's called um, uh, something fresh, is is the name of the toothpaste, Winter Fresh or something like that. I I, I don't remember that, exact, but it's when it first, it still exists to this day, and it was when it first came on the market. And we came up with a dope college, um, national college campaign where we were doing these amazing uh, college study breaks across the country. Um, and, and, and we did it to where you could literally uh, go into the student unions and we teamed up with all the frats and the sororities on the different college campuses across the country. Um, we, we, we did it with, with, with I, I don't know, something like 12 or 15 HBCUs. It, it just was a crazy dope campaign. And we did these study breaks 
um, during the midterms and also the finals where, where the kids could take a break from their day and they could come into the student union and we had DJs and we had pizza and we had masseuses and all of these different things where the kids could relax. But when they got there, it was all of this signage with, with um, Colgate. And then we had these care packages because when you're away at school, you know, that's what you really need is, is toothpaste and all of these different things for your toiletries. Like college students are broke. So all of that made a, made a difference. And my philosophy always was, you know, get an apple before it falls from the tree. And what I mean by that is if we got these kids uh, to really adopt the brand Colgate early in their career, if, if we showed them that Colgate actually cares about your studies, Colgate cares about your mental health, Colgate cares that, that you could come and take a break on them. Those same kids, when they graduate school and they get out there into the world and they start building their own family, they're already invested in that brand emotionally. And that was, was one of the successes of that particular campaign. And we ran it for many years and, and it was multi-layered. So it wasn't just on schools, but off the top of my head, and I'm talking about something that happened 20 years ago, um, off the top of my head, I know that that college program doing those study break lounges was huge for us. Got you, got you. Well, how do you evaluate how you, what you should do, right? So we go from music to beer to Colgate, right? You all these across these different things. After doing stuff for a certain period of time, right? There becomes this this system for yourself and how you approach things when 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 you start off, no matter where you're starting. Um, what what is that that you kind of develop for yourself in terms of how you would approach a product that I might just give you today about an industry that you don't really know? First and foremost, like the way I always do it and the way I've always done it, I'll go into our conference room and we 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 sit around our conference table, me and our team, we call it the war room, and we just brainstorm, period. It's no, 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 there's no idea, there's no suggestion, there's no question, there's no answer. That's a bad one. So we have a product. So let's just say you came to me and you are, are, are interested in, in, in getting puppy food out there to dog owners. I got to first introduce it to my team. We all do individual research on it. We do individual research on the marketplace. And then we go into the war room and we think about extremely creative ideas, ideas that are going to resonate in my strength, like I said earlier, is our community, the black and brown community. That, that's where we excel. We do a lot of market marketing in the general market, but most times companies come to us specifically because they want it, they want their product um, in, 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 into our community with our people. So we'll sit around and we just come up with some of the most creative ideas that we can. Sometimes we hit it out the park with three, four, five great ones off the rip. And sometimes it might take us two, three, four days, a week of brainstorming before we can narrow it down to even three dope ideas to put on a proposal and go back to the client. Now, you work in the world of digital marketing. Offline marketing is very different. And, and when I talk about offline marketing, I'm talking... I don't know, uh, grassroots and alternative marketing, uh, print ads, uh, more general or, or more general marketing, like, like television, radio spots. It's not as quantifiable. We don't have the same metrics that somebody in your case may have. And that's okay. You know, with, with you, you could, you could, you could give direct messages. Well, the reach was this much, this many people, um, shared this many people right. open this many people spent 30 seconds watching your video yada 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 we don't have those same metrics but what we do have is you know and we've come up with a system in house I, I won't necessarily say it here because I don't want other companies you know taking our, our, our metric system but yeah. we can tell how many people were affected by these campaigns that we ran how many people 
participated in it, what was the feedback, the retention, all of that good stuff. So it, it's a little different process, but it's kind of the same. Got you. Got you. What made you develop that system? Was it um, the companies you were working with asking for or were you having trouble convincing them of what you needed? Um, both. And that's a very smart and, and very insightful question on your side. Uh, it was both. When, when, when I worked records for a living, um, you know, now everything is online. It's about streaming, but it's the same different. But when I was working records, we, everything was about radio. So, you know, you would have to look at, at uh, BDS every week, um, which pretty much would tell you, well, look, you know, the record got spun this many times at this station in this market, um, so forth and so on. When it came to marketing regular products, we don't have a BDS system. There's no real way to, to, you know, at the time, there was no real way to develop these metrics. So number one, we had to justify why these, the companies, they wanted to invest in us. They wanted to invest in our community because they understand we are the top spending community on planet earth. And more important than that, we're the trendsetters. When we say something is hot, when, when we put our stamp of approval on it, it might start on a city block, but it goes viral. And now little Joey in, in, in Maine or middle America at a suburb somewhere is wearing his pants saggy or wearing his pants tight or rocking these new J's. We have that kind of influence. So we had to really come up with a system for the exact same reasons that you said. Number one, we had to justify, you know, our job and our effectiveness. And number two, they work in, they, they, they work in corporate office. Everything for them is numbers. How do, how do they justify the spend to their higher ups, to their bosses? So, so that was the reason why we came up with this system. Got you. Got you. Did you ever fully, completely get out of music, right? And say, I'm done with music or um, has it, I don't know. Or has it always been an in and out type relationship? How, what, what's your current relationship with music since that's where you started? Currently, I'm fully out. I'm fully, okay. well, if you want to consider Global Spin Awards, Global Spin Awards keeps me one foot in, but my my day-to-day -day love for the music it doesn't it doesn't compare to my love for giving back to our community my love for motivational speaking my love for educating my love for showing people that if a a a young man born dead broke in the south bronx new york can somehow figure out a way to to pull itself up by his bootstraps with very, very little help, no mentors, any of that stuff, and do some of the things, a portion of what I've done. You can do it too. And I just, you, so, so to answer your question, these days, with the exception of Global Spin Awards, I'm, I'm pretty much out. I've outgrown it. Um, I, I love my time in it. But I, I always have been a, a huge proponent of doing purpose-driven work, working within my gifts. And when I no longer, my, when my heart doesn't beat, when, when, when I don't wake up and I'm like, yo, I, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just ready to go savage. I'm just ready to, to, to go out there and conquer the world. Not for, not for anything other than this is what I do. When that feeling leaves me, then I know it's time to move on. And um, that feeling had left me for music a couple, a few years ago now. And, um, you know, and, and, and that's why I spend the majority of my days doing what I do in terms of motivational speaking and just educating. Gotcha. When you talk about motivational speaking um, and educating, and what are your plans with that? Is that like a, um, like, you know, you, you, you do it to do it in certain places? Are you trying to build some kind of, career out of it or like is, you know is it casual what's the what, what's your outlook on it are you trying to are you trying to be the vp of 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 you know motivational speaking how how what is that okay that's a great question um 
Well, it ain't casual. Uh, okay. I, this is what I do for a living. This is how I, I, well, I'm not gonna say how I earn my living. I earn my living through, through two places. Well, let me stop lying. I, I did a lot of investing in all of that good stuff. So, so there are revenue streams that, that are just passive. Um, yeah. But still the marketing agency does extremely well. And now the motivational speaking uh, you know, is, is another major revenue stream for me. You'd be surprised how, many, how much um, motivational speakers make. You'd be surprised at the demand for motivational speakers. I never saw this as a career for myself. I never ever knew it was a career that existed. Again, I did it for the love. I did it because I wanted to give back. I did it because I want to, to encourage people. I don't care you know, what life, what the, 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 the hand that life has dealt you so far. That's, that's today, that's yesterday, but there's always a tomorrow. And for me right now, my goal is to speak and, and, and breathe life into and pour into at least 150 million people before I leave this earth. And maybe that's even a low number. Um, but, but I do travel. I do, you know, I spend a huge part of my day um, now, especially with COVID, speaking to corporations, speaking to schools, speaking to correctional facilities via Zoom, um, virtually. I'm almost, and this is almost literally uh, uh, three, four times a week at this point. So, so my schedule is, is, is extremely packed with just speaking. You'd be surprised. Man, yeah, that's, it's interesting to hear, right? You're just, there's so many different industries and ways to, um, yeah, not only make a living, but just like the uh, formal ways where people have find value and stuff and are willing to, whether it's pay for it um, or however they uh, acquire a service. And I just, motivational speaking actually was like music to me where it's hard to see that as a career, right? Like I didn't think of music as a career a space where people made money. It's just something you enjoyed or you consume. Um, and with that being said, the, that 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 just brings light on the other side of things, the entrepreneur side. And I want to get an idea, right? You talked about, yo, you motivational speaking right now, but that's not something that you could be doing in the way that you're talking about if you just did the the record label thing, was just that bad boy, and that was like your peak, right? You sustained, you evolved. And you've built some things from an entrepreneur's perspective where you, you have to have some systems in place if you're spending this kind of time, right, <laughs> doing this and you're still good, like you said, financially, you know what I mean? It don't look like that's the cheapest chair behind you. <laughs> it's probably a nice office. So how do you, how do you get to that point where you're, you're able to live and, and focus on just the things that make your heart beat versus, yo, I got to get this next check in the business. I got to build this out. How did you get to that point? You know, you're asking beautiful questions, Sean, real talk. Um, I, I, I love that you're asking these questions because it allows me to do what I do and what I love to do, which is give advice and, and, and to shed light and to pour into people. Uh, you know, I, I, I did it the same way, or I treated it the same way that, that I treated music back in the mid nineties. Um, you know, I was like you, I didn't know, I didn't know music was a career. I had no idea. I didn't know, like I grew up in the South Bronx. M music was in my soul. Hip hop was in my blood from the day I was born. Like South Bronx is where this hip hop culture was created, but I never, ever, ever knew that it was a career attached to it. And more important, I don't sing, I don't rap. I can't make a beat to save my life. I hate the studio, even though I thought I wanted to be an A&R. I hate the studio. Yeah. I don't smoke weed. All artists do when they get in them studios, it ain't no windows. I can't open a window up. They smoking weed, killing me in there. So <laughs> I thought you had to be in front of a microphone yeah. if you wanted to be in the music industry. 
But that didn't stop my passion and it didn't stop my desire for knowing that that was the industry for me. And if you just trust, if you trust, like we are all born with this, call it a GPS, call it a, a six sense, call it an inner compass. It always points you in the right direction of what you should be doing, where you should be taking your life. But most of us don't listen. We, we wave it off. We don't want to hear it. It's, it's, we know better than this internal guidance system that God gave all of us. And, we, so, and, and many times we are too scared to trust that inner voice. So when I, back in the days, just started researching and, 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 and understanding, I know I'm not supposed to be in front of a mic, but there gotta be other ways. God opened up the door to the first internship. And I was able to be like, go to a record label and be like, yo, these people are just like me. Like, like, like they don't have a desire to be in front of a microphone and they're making great money. And it's the same thing here. Truth be told, Sean, I never saw this as a career. I didn't even know it was a career. Me giving advice, me helping people, me, me, me trying to always be the one to speak positivity into my staff, friends, family, that's, that's, that's who I want. God made me this way. And when I, when I started to fall out of love with music and I really didn't know which direction I, because I always did music in my, in my um, marketing agency kind of simultaneous. So when I speak music, I'm, I'm also speaking um, Power Moves Inc. marketing and promotion because we worked so many records and so, so much stuff. But when I fell out of love with the music, I didn't know what was the next chapter in my life. I, I really didn't. And then I started to say, yo, you know what? I'm going to just do what is in my heart to do. And it's like I told you earlier, and I think the biggest mistake that people make is they look at what's in front of them. They look at what they know. They look at what they can see. You can't see the pot of, the, of gold that's on the other side of that rainbow. God didn't reveal that to you yet. He just told you, follow the yellow brick road and get to the other side. That's all you're responsible for doing. So when you ask me, how did I, you know, take this risk into motivational speaking, a career I didn't even know that existed. I didn't even know you could make a living at it. I trusted my heart. I trusted my gut. I trusted my spirit. It's always, it has never, ever, ever, ever failed me. And when I just surrendered and I just said to myself, well, better yet, I said to God, I submit, if this is what you want me to do, I don't know where this road is going to lead me. I have no idea. But if it's what you want me to do, I am bold enough and, 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 and I am obedient enough to walk down this road. And when I did, doors started to open. God started to reveal to me, this is a career, just like music was. It's actually a career. So, I, you know, I just trust the process. I really do. I hope if nothing comes out of this interview that your people can take away. I know we spent a lot of time talking on marketing, but I like to speak on life. And, and I would tell any and everybody, trust the process. Trust it. That inner voice in you, it never lies. If it tells you to go left, don't even look right. Go left. Yeah, I like that. Um, well, speaking of life, right? You mentioned your staff. That's dealing with people, right? And then, I mean, you know, what you were doing in the 90s, it's a lot of interesting people that you've been around. <laughs> how do you deal with people, right? And how does that, um, yeah, how do you deal with people um, and, and, and judge people's character? Are we talking people who work for me or in general? People who work for you and spe specifically people. Yeah. People who specifically work for you. Okay. I am an extremely loyal human being by nature. That's just who I am, but I'm a very difficult boss. And I believe I'm a person 
I give it my all. I, I, I truly do. I'm ready, I'm ready to, 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 to get on the battlefield of life and fight to the death. Either, either life is going to bend, either life is going to break, either life is going to fold, and I'm getting to the other side of success, or we both going to die on the battlefield. It's just that simple for me. But I have that same expectation for my staff. I have the same expectation for anybody who I hire. You got to go as hard as me. I'm not saying that you have to be the smartest. I'm not saying that you got to be somebody with 10 degrees on the wall. What I am saying is you have to be someone that understands no. The word no is an invitation for you to stop for a second, say, okay, this way didn't work. Now let me figure it out. But I don't tolerate people who take no and just accept it as that's your final answer? Yes, that's my final answer. Oh, okay, you got to get fired because we not we not working and in, in seeing eye to eye right here. But truth of the matter is finding good people, finding qualified people, finding hungry people is very difficult. And that's why I am very slow to hire. And I'll tell you, you know, it's kind of my Achilles heel because I don't like firing people, but I'm getting better at it that now I try to be a little quicker with letting people go. Dead weight is the worst thing you can keep on your ship when you are trying to grow a company. And I'll tell this to any business owner, like I can only tell you my experience but when, when, when I was building the, the, the agency, we started out with people we could afford. Usually that's friends, it's family, and more times than not, I hate to say it, but they're not qualified. They're qualified to take you maybe from, from bringing in revenues of zero to, to $50,000, $100,000 annually. But that's where their skill set might stop. And if those people are not willing to grow, if those people are not willing, because a lot of time people want to throw in your face, yo, I've been there with you from day one. I was here when it was no business coming in the door. Well, I thank you for that. And you got paid for it. I appreciate it. But if you are not willing to invest in yourself and now get this company from 100,000 to a million, from a million to 5 million, Sometimes you got to do some spring cleaning. You got to be willing to change your staff because, I mean, we see it. I don't know, you know, if anybody watching this are, are, are fans of sports, but you see some of these athletes who are, are world renowned, they can get their team to the playoffs, but they can never get them out of the playoffs. Mm -hmm. They can get their team to the final, but they can never win the chip. It's like, sometimes you have to be ready to, to, to say, look, you served your purpose. Just like the seasons, everybody ain't meant to be with you for eternity. You got summer, spring, winter, and fall. Those seasons change and it's okay. It might hurt you. I've had to let go family members. I've had to let go friends. I've had to look people in the face who put the guilt trip on me talking about I was here when you wasn't making no money and you wasn't quote unquote Sean Perez. And that's true. But if I, Sean, wake up every day at three, four in the morning and I'm working on my craft and I'm doing whatever I got to do to win, if you're not putting in that same effort to take your skill set to the next level, you can't make me feel bad because I want to continue to grow this company. Yep. It's just not fair. Mm. what's the impact of keeping somebody on too long death death of your company you 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 have to if you are somebody and again i'm a loyal person so i say this with, with with loyalty running through my veins one of the biggest mistakes sean prez has 
has made one of the biggest regrets I have in business is keeping the wrong people on staff too long. It, it, your business can't grow. Your business is it's accumulation of the people in it, the people who run it. You, Sean, you're at the head of the table. Your job is to be CEO. You're the visionary. But you you can't do all of the little things that you once did. You got to like you got to go out there and hunt. You got to bring business in. And if your staff ain't allowing you to be a CEO, to be the person who hunts and brings back that 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 food to to, to so that the, the the staff, the bills can get paid, the lights can stay on, that they that their checks clear week over week. If they're not allowing you to do what you do best, then you got the wrong staff. So keeping the wrong people on payroll too, too long will, will result in your business closing the door. It's just that simple. Mm. What is that impact on other team members? Like the person, you know, business is not dead, but it's you're, you're lingering and it's taking too long. Like what do you what have you seen in terms of details, signs that this is starting to take an impact, or, um, or yeah, like just what is what is some of that close impact? Just a practical insight into uh, a space where there's somebody that 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 is outgrowing, or I'll say it this way, I'll make it clear. How does it become clear, right, that the, the wrong person is now in that role? Okay, yeah, because I was gonna ask you, I was like, you know, I, I need clarity on that question. Mm -hmm. True truth is, if you have to talk to some, I'm a details person, that's just who I am. Um, me working on Diddy's management team, me being his tour manager for many years, I was responsible for 50 million moving pieces at once, making mm -hmm. sure that everybody had their room keys making sure the hotels were paid for in advance, making sure everybody knew what time they were supposed to be in the lobby, making sure the bus was outside, making sure the plane tickets was bought, all of those little things that nobody thinks about, I was responsible for. And that didn't even mention making sure, you know, rehearsals and people get on stage when they're supposed to, making sure that the drummers and the musicians knew their cues and the transition and all of that craziness. So I'm detailed I don't, I'd say by nature, but it was really amplified when, 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 when I was in that role working side by side with Puff for so many years. So if I find myself talking to the same person about the same thing again and again, then that means I can't do my job because now I'm micromanaging you on you doing your job. That doesn't help me, it don't help you, and it don't help this company. So you will know off rip, if you have to continue to talk to the same person, if, if, if things are dropping through the holes and every time you turn around, the balls are being dropped and it always comes back to that same person, is letting you know that either this person they don't take their job as serious as you take it. It's letting you know that this person, you know, maybe it's time for a suspension or talking to, but if it continues to happen, it, it's time for them to go. And I can tell you this, people who care, you know, because I've had assistants who work for me. And I, I'm not the easiest person. You are gonna get emails at three in the morning. I, I'm demanding because I demand a lot for myself. And some of these assistants felt like they was going to break. Some of them was like, yo, I can't take this. It's too intense. I don't get paid enough. Like, like what you, what you paying me, I can go somewhere else and make a lot more and, and I can be off at five. And that might be true. But when you work for Sean Prez, I'm building green berets. Like, like, like I'm building Navy SEALs. We we at war here. Like like you okay, you can go over there, but you're not gonna come out of there as experienced 
you're not going to come out of there season as you are working with me. And the people who have challenges, some of them are going to, to recognize this guy is not on my back for no reason. I actually am dropping the ball. Some of them are going to tap out and put in their resignation. And then others I've seen recognize this is not him picking on me. It's not him even wanting to get my behind on a daily basis. I am responsible for anything that he's talking to me about. And then they step up and they rise to the occasion. And those are the stories that I love. Those are the people who to this day, even though they've gone on the greener pastures, will tell you I'm the best boss they've ever had because I challenged them in a way and made them step up in a way that they didn't even know they had in them. Got you, got you. That's what's up. So, I mean, obviously we, we've got touched a range of topics and I, I think it's extremely insightful and useful to hear just that perspective um, in terms of the entrepreneur, the entrepreneur and dealing with people because so much of this is, is people, right? You, you really summed it up when you said the business's output is a commu a commu an accumulation of the people, right, inside of it. Um, at what point did you personally feel like, yo, me as a, as a boss, as a leader, I need to improve, right? You found yourself personally in the same way you might look at people and say, yo, you're dropping the ball. Did you feel like, yeah, I know I go hard and it might not even be like for lack of effort, but it's just something that that's missing that I need to get over and, um, and, and, and faith and, and improve that. Are you asking me for specific examples? That'd be nice if you had like, just maybe just one thing um, and that mentality on how you had to approach it because in leadership at some point, right? There, there's a, there's usually something where it's, what do they call it? The, uh, I forgot the name for it. Imposter syndrome almost at some point, right? Where you feel like, yo, like, can I really do this? It's not even like, oh, I'm not a confident person, but it's like, yo, it's, it's a lot going on. This is crazy. How can I actually make this happen? There's a lot of people relying on me for life and everything. I'm, I'm, I'm feeding people and their families at this point. Did you ever get to any of that kind of point where it just happened to be the right storm where you actually processed it in that way and, and there was a, a hill to get over and you knew that if, the, if we didn't get over this hill, right, and I didn't figure out how to get over this hill, that things might, you know, the shit might crash. Did you ever, ever, ever find your place, yourself in a place like that? Sean, are you kidding me? The, 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 if any CEO <laughs> tells you that they have never found themselves in a place like that, either they are managing a team of one, which is themselves, mm. or they are just downright lying. Like, bottom line is, they ain't no, I don't care if you Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, I don't care who you are. Listen, as a CEO of a company, I remember early when, when I would look around the office and I would look at these individuals and they would dawn on me, like their check says Power Moves Inc. They feed their families based off a business that I built. I mean, we built it together, but at the end of the day, if that check don't clear, that responsibility falls on me. So there's not a CEO out there who has one employee or a thousand employees who hasn't sat and had that thought. But to answer your question more specifically, I lived through, not just lived through, but I was in business through the greatest recession since the Great Depression. 08, 09, 10, 11. Do you think 
anybody in business, y'all think COVID is bad. Try going back to that market crash of 08, 07, 08. Go, go back that far. If you really want to be tested as a CEO, as a leader, as a visionary, as somebody's boss, those years were so freaking trying. And that is, I hang my hat on those years because our phones that was a, they wasn't ringing for months on end. Nobody was spending money. Nobody was hiring marketing. Nah, we trying to keep the doors open. We ain't got time to be marketing our products. But I never, ever, ever laid anybody off during that time. And that is when I will honestly say, or one of the, well, I'm going to say that was, that was the greatest test to me as a CEO. A good friend of mine told me, Prez, good leaders survive hard times. And I can't tell you, I always thought I was a good businessman, but that what that right there, like, like I feel like I graduated summa cum laude, laude magna cum laude from a, a, a freaking Ivy League institution just to get out of those difficult years was so very, very difficult. And, and, and I'm so proud of myself. I can't tell you how many times the staff left the office and I was staying there to the wee hours of the morning because I was praying and trying to strategize and figure things out because by day, I had to keep my game face on with that staff. They couldn't see me stress. They couldn't see me, yo, I'm the leader of this ship. Like I can't be up in there sweating bullets, even though the phones wasn't ringing, even though we had no money coming in the door and then going home, I got a family and, and I didn't want to go look them in the face. Like, yo, damn, did we, did, it's another week, two weeks, month that went by and, and, and no money came in the door. So I would stay in that office praying, strategizing, stressed, and just telling myself, prayers, you can do this. Prayers, you can do this. God did not put you on this path to leave you. You can do this. And it was nothing but the grace of God that got us through those difficult years. So you damn right when you ask that question. I've been through it. I'll be lying to you if I told you I didn't. And that's why I'm so appreciative. Like, like, like whenever, uh, you know, we're flourishing, I know what it's like to, 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 to be, you know, a client might call and, and the client don't know how twisted you are. The client don't know how bad you need that check. And I got to sit there and negotiate with them knowing damn well, if they be like, well, we're going to take this business and give a check to another agency. I, 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 that, that, that could be the difference between us closing the door or not. I know what it is to be in that place. And I think anybody who's done anything great or built anything great has been in that same position. <laughs> true words, man. True words. I uh, appreciate uh... I mean, really, really, again, just that aspect and that insight on things. Um, I feel like there might be another time we have to talk where we can go just deeper in just to business, to leadership and those trials and tribulations. That's a whole conversation in and of itself. Um, but man, I don't want to even take too much more of your time. I really appreciate you. Um, do you have anything that you would like to leave with the people, a place that they should go uh, you know, find you at? piece of piece of advice where, where you want to leave them off yes first and foremost i want to tell you sean thank you so much i know you don't interview a lot of people um so thank you for for allowing me onto your platform i appreciate you and i applaud you for all the good work you're doing uh, really sharing your knowledge really helping to break so many of these artists and, and and just what you're doing on youtube in terms of giving out all of that free game um to anybody it's, it's crazy, right? Because you can you can put that out there, but it's up to the people to seek it out. Like there, there should be nobody out here who's broke. It should be nobody out here who, who's not making it because people like yourself 
you you you're giving away the gems for free. You're giving away the jewels. All people got to do is do the research. So with that being said, I can be found across all platforms at Power Moves Press, P-O-W-E-R-M-O-V-E-S. And my last name is Prez. P is in Paul, R is in Roger, E is in Elvis, Z is in Zebra. And I would also like for anybody, if you love interviews like this, uh, I've really dedicated my life to interviewing high net worth individuals, people who are uh, kindred spirits, similar mindset, people I've come into contact over my journey. And I sit and I do exactly what Sean did to me. I try to interview and extract as much information, education, wisdom, and gems from these people who are willing to give away their knowledge um, for free. Actually, Sean was, was a guest on, on our um, YouTube channel. So please go ahead, just punch in Power Move Prez um, on YouTube. Please subscribe to our channel. And in you know, at the end of the day, Sean, I really want to see the advancement of our people. So if anybody is trying to advance those are the places that you can find me. You're never going to see me bragging about what I have, um, the places I've been. It's really about education. So if you're serious about your career, if you're serious about success, go follow me, subscribe to me on YouTube. And if you're just looking for flashy cars and all of that, I'm not your guy. Love it, man. Love it. That's a great way to end it. And once again, this was Sean Prez. Definitely check him out. Power Moves will put all his information up on the screen, all of that good stuff. And of course, if you like this video, go hit the like button. If you like it, you might as well share it. And if you're not subscribed, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button. It's the network.